Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about American evangelical Christianity and purity culture. The four books that I'm gonna be reading and discussing for the purposes of this video are Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation by Kristen Cobes Dumez, Hashtag Church 2, How Purity Culture Upholds Abuse and How to Find Healing by Emily Joy Allison, Romancing God, Evangelical Women and Inspirational Fiction by Lynn S. Neal. And finally, The Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth by Beth Allison Barr. These are all nonfiction titles. Three of them are academic titles. So that's what I'm going to be working from. Hi friends. So I am currently editing this video. I'm two books in and I'm realizing that this project just has a lot more content and scope to it than I originally realized. And so for that reason, I'm going to be turning this into a multi-part video series. You are going to hear me talking about the first two books on this TBR that I set for myself in this video. And both of those books are about the history of Christianity and of the treatment of women and men in the church. So I think they fit together pretty well. Then in part two, I'm going to be talking about inspirational fiction or Christian romance novels and their impact on women and gender roles in the church. And then lastly, in part three, I will be reading two books. You'll see at the end of this video that I'm adding a book to my TBR, but I'm going to be reading two books about the impact of purity culture. One is Church Two that I mentioned earlier, and one is this book that just came out that from what I'm hearing is maybe just repackaging purity culture for a new generation. So I want to read it myself and see what I think, but I'm going to be pairing those two books together in part three of this video series. So I know this initial video is really long, but there's a lot to say and a lot to discuss here. Who knows, maybe if I feel inspired to continue the series, I will, but you're going to be getting a series of videos where I'll be discussing based on books that I'm reading on these topics. <laughs> I want to talk about a few things up front so you know what you're getting into before you dive into this video. First of all, we are going to be touching on some sensitive and difficult topics. This includes things like different forms of abuse, toxic masculinity, misogyny, homophobia. Be prepared for the fact that this, there are going to be some sensitive and difficult topics covered in today's video. And secondly, because I'm not sure what kind of reach this video might end up having or if it's going to reach people who don't know much about me or who I am, like people who follow me regularly do, you should probably know a few things about me and the perspective that you are getting with all of these topics. I am a bisexual cis woman in her mid-30s who is married with two biracial children. I am a former evangelical, but I no longer subscribe to that, and I am actively deconstructing from evangelical Christianity, so I'm not always 100% sure where I land on everything theologically. Some of it, I'm still figuring it out. I came of age in the late 90s and early aughts in the Northwestern United States. I'm sure all of those things influence the experiences that I've had and the kinds of responses that I've had to some of this material. I am a former Republican, current liberal Democrat, pro-gay, trans, and indigenous rights, Black Lives Matter. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think you get, you get the picture of where I'm coming from. So I was raised in a very conservative environment by parents who were always a little bit more moderate than the people in the churches we went to and are now much more moderate than they used to be, but still quite conservative. So that's me. I guess the other thing I should say is I don't want to speak for anybody else. And so if in the course of this video, I talk at all about my childhood and adolescent experiences, I am just speaking from my experiences, from my memory of things that happened. Other people may have experienced things differently than I did. So <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of setup, but um, I feel like I feel like this is going to be a lengthy video. I've only read one of these books, and I have a lot to say about it. The book that I have finished reading so far for this video is Jesus and John Wayne, and wow, there was a lot. I am not usually a big um, tabber of my books, but in this case, there was just so much that I wanted to keep track of. I think this book is phenomenal. I didn't know a ton about it going in other than the topic, but one thing you should know is it's written by a professor who is a historian, and 
It's interesting because it is a history of evangelical Christianity in America from the early 1900s through the Trump years. I think this is an excellent piece of nonfiction. It's very well argued, and we're going to dive into a lot of the nitty gritty. I'm going to read some small passages from the book during the course of the things I'm going to talk about, and this, this might be lengthy, so uh, get a snack, get a drink, we're going to be here for a while. I have notes and page numbers. It may not be clear from the very beginning, but by the end I think it becomes pretty obvious that the main thesis that this book is arguing is that how we got to evangelicals voting for and supporting Trump is rooted in a history of promoting strong patriarchy, traditional gender roles, toxic masculinity, and a more militant version of Christianity beginning in the early 1900s, and how that kind of created fertile ground for abuse. I should also say this book really focuses on the white evangelical movement, and there is definitely a difference. I think that is one thing is that race ends up playing a significant role in the history of the evangelical church and some of the current things that are happening with it, even though there are certainly individual people in the church who may not consider themselves to be racist or may not realize that they're part of a movement that has its roots in racist things. I told you we were going to talk about sensitive, <laughs> sensitive issues. On page 11 of the book, she says, As we will see, the roots of militarized and politicized evangelical masculinity stretch back to earlier in American history. Antecedents can be found in the 19th century Southern evangelicalism and in early 20th century, quote, muscular Christianity. But it was in the 1940s and 1950s that a potent mix of patriarchal gender traditionalism, militarism, and Christian nationalism coalesced to form the basis of a revitalized evangelical identity. So she starts by looking back at where all of this began, and it is fascinating. We look at the early 1900s, and she says, by the early 20th century, Christians recognized that they had a masculinity problem, basically a branding problem. Unable to shake the sense that Christianity had a less than masculine feel, many blamed the faith itself, or at least the, quote, feminization of Victorian Christianity, which privileged gentility, restraint, and an emotive response to the gospel message. So beginning in the early 1900s, there was this effort to kind of rebrand the church, rebrand Christianity as a more aggressive, masculine version, and paint Jesus as a man's man. And then you get things where the church becomes very tied in into American politics, tied into the military, which is seen as a great ground for proselytizing. And, you know, like it just gets more and more entwined in interesting ways. So why John Wayne? And I think what's interesting is that by the end of the book, she does a good job of drawing parallels between John Wayne, who became a big symbol for American evangelicals when he was popular, and Donald Trump, because they have a lot in common, and it's interesting. Wayne was not an evangelical Christian, despite rumors to this effect regularly circulated by evangelicals themselves. He did not live a moral life by the standards of a traditional Christian virtue. Yet for many evangelicals, Wayne would come to symbolize a different set of virtues, a nostalgic yearning for a mythical Christian America, a return to, quote, traditional gender roles, and the reassertion of white patriarchal authority. Sound familiar? <laughs> closer to the end of the book, talking about the Trump election. For many evangelicals, Donald Trump did not represent the betrayal of many of the values they had come to hold dear. His testosterone-fueled masculinity aligned remarkably well with that long championed by conservative evangelicals. What makes for a strong leader? A virile white man. And what of his vulgarity, crudeness, bombast, even sexual assaults? Well, boys will be boys. God-given testosterone came with certain side effects, but an aggressive and even reckless masculinity was precisely what was needed when dealing with the enemy. And so part of it is this idea of this very aggressive patriarchal form of masculinity and selling that that is what it means to be a man and that's how men were made and how that ties into ideas about women and what it means to be feminine, which we will get to, like it, it makes a lot of sense. So if you were confused about how that happened, how like supposedly moral evangelicals could support somebody with so many moral failings, I think this book 
does a great job of covering that. Let's talk a little bit about links of American evangelical Christianity to segregation and racist ideologies, because that's interesting. The evangelical political resurgence of the 1970s coalesced around a potent mix of, quote, family values politics, but family values were always intertwined with ideas about sex, power, race, and nation. Feminism posed a threat to traditional womanhood and also to national security by removing from men their duty to provide and protect, and opening the door to women in military combat. Civil rights was also viewed as something that was destabilizing the social order. There was this imagined threat to white womanhood, and because patriarchal masculinity within the evangelical church, and we'll continue to see this moving forward, it was framed as men's job is to protect and provide. Part of that is protecting white women from this imagined black threat. It also talks about how during the civil rights era in the wake of Brown v. Board of Education, a lot of Southerners and Southern Christians and evangelicals were upset about desegregation. And so they turned to the idea of private Christian schools as an alternative to protect their precious children from being in desegregated classrooms. This is also tied in some interesting ways to the issue of abortion rights. And the, I've, I've learned through this and through other places recently some things that I personally didn't know. I think a lot of the rhetoric in the evangelical church is that when Roe v. Wade happened, American Christians were immediately kind of up in arms and against abortion rights. Turns out that's not so much true. All of this happened when there was also desegregation happening, and some of these people who were concerned about desegregation needed an issue that they could rally people behind politically, and abortion was that issue. And so the concern was less about abortion itself at the time and more about desegregation, but using abortion as a wedge issue to vote for the candidate that they thought would be anti-civil rights or wouldn't allow as many civil rights things through, which is a trip. In fact, this book has some interesting information on where beliefs were at prior to Roe v. Wade. Catholics had a long history of condemning abortion even when women's lives were at stake, and some fundamentalist pastors agreed, but they weren't eager to cooperate with Catholics on the issue. But most evangelicals were far less certain. The Bible didn't offer specific advice on the topic. Many evangelicals disapproved of, quote, abortion on demand, but not in the case of rape or incest, where fetal abnormalities were present, or when a woman's life was at risk. In 1968, Christianity Today considered the question of therapeutic abortion. Was it a blessing or murder? They gave no definitive answer. As late as 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention passed a resolution urging states to expand access to abortion. But with the liberalization of abortion laws and as abortion proponents began to reframe the issue in terms of women controlling their reproduction, evangelicals started to reconsider their position. Roe v. Wade started to force the issue, but even then mobilization was not immediate. Only in time as abortion became more closely linked to feminism and the sexual revolution did evangelicals begin to frame it not as a difficult moral choice, but rather as an assault on women's God-given role on the family and on Christian America itself. Itself. All of which is fascinating and I didn't know because that's not the way it's talked about anymore and this isn't the only thing like that. One of the big themes you see kind of drawn throughout this book is it talks about the rise of complementarian theology. If you're not familiar with co what complementarianism is, this book quotes Elizabeth Elliot's book, Let Me Be a Woman, where she kind of gets into the fundamentals of these ideas. The basic idea is that God created male and female as complementary opposites. Elliot explained, quote, the woman is totally other, totally different, totally God's gift to man. God gave husbands their rank and virile drive for domination, necessary to fulfill their duty to rule. Self-denial, meanwhile, was at the heart of Christian womanhood. Marriage and motherhood required self-giving, sacrifice, and suffering. Yet men were required to love their wives, as this was the biblical basis for chivalry. Love and submission were intimately intertwined. The basic premise behind this is that men and women are fundamentally different. It sets the world up as existing in a very binary version of gender and gender identity, where women are supposed to be meek, sweet, submissive, supportive, and men are supposed to be aggressors, dominant, virile, protective, militant. 
And, you know, this creates a lot of problems, of course, especially when it's woven into religion in the way that this was and creates kind of fertile grounds for abuse. And as we'll see, there there's a lot of that that ends up happening. But this sort of toxic masculinity is exactly what was promulgated. And it was really interesting to me as it started to get closer and closer to the time that I was alive and that I remember, because it starts talking about books by people that I read. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things that we read in youth group, things that my friends would talk about, things that shaped my ideas of gender and sexuality and who I was and who other people were and how to understand men in ways that I am still deconstructing from because they were so harmful. Some of you who've been in the circle might be familiar with Bill Gothard, who is the creator of the ideology that the Duggar family from reality television subscribed to, but he was influenced by this guy named Rushdini, who was very extreme in his views. In fact, he insisted that the Civil War was not a battle over slavery, but instead a religious war in which the South was defending Christian civilization. In his view, slavery had been voluntary and beneficial to slaves. He opposed interracial marriage, looked unfavorably on the education of African Americans and women, and disapproved of women's suffrage and of women speaking in public. Some of his writings were also bordering on anti-Semitism. His work influenced Bill Gothard. Bill Gothard believed that most problems could be solved by submitting to the proper authorities in each domain of life. He advanced the idea of a divinely ordained chain of command, similar to that of the military. In the family, the father was the ultimate authority. A wife owed her husband total submission, requiring approval for even the smallest household decisions, and children owed parents absolute obedience in both action and attitude. Uh, I mean, you can see where this is going. It is also worth noting that Bill Gothard eventually stepped down after many, many allegations of abuse, sexual assault, and molestation. He had very strict ideas of purity and what girls should and shouldn't be doing, but was meanwhile grooming young women. So, you know, and he's he's not the only one. There were a slew of these hyper-masculine leaders in the church who behind the scenes were engaged in a lot of abusive practices. Like I said, while I did know people who subscribed to Bill Gothard's brand of child rearing and Christianity, that wasn't what my family grew up in. I grew up with Dr. James Dobson and Focus on the Family. Like that was around a lot. And you know, it seems great until, <laughs> until you start reading more about what Dr. Dobson actually believed about men and women, about gender roles, about parenting methods, and how politically active he was. It It's a trip. And so like this guy that I always thought of as like a, you know, a nice surrogate grandfatherly type person, you know, is, is a more complicated figure. According to the book, in 1975, Dobson took it upon himself to articulate the critical difference between men and women. Males and females differ biochemically, anatomically, and emotionally, he asserted. In truth, they're unique in every cell of their bodies. Men like to hunt, fish, and hike in the wilderness, while women prefer to stay at home and wait for them. <laughs> Men play sports as women watch yawning on the sidelines. But perhaps the most profound difference between men and women, according to Dr. Dobson, was their source of self-esteem. He said, men derive self-esteem by being respected and women feel worthy when they are loved. Because of a man's fragile ego and enormous need to be respected, together with a woman's vulnerability and need to be loved, it was a mistake to tamper with the time-honored relationship of husband as loving protector and wife as recipient of that protection, which again creates these very specific ideas of who men and women are. It creates this kind of false binary as if women don't also need to be respected and men don't also need to be loved. I just, it, yeah. <laughs> and I will say that like this idea of men having a fragile ego, that is socialized, you know, like that's not inbred. Just, yeah. So Dr. Dobson wrote a lot of books about child rearing and marriage, and there were a lot of books that were trying to navigate how you talk to women about sex in marriage when they're told, sex is bad, wait, 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 and then they're suddenly supposed to be super sexual once they're married, and like, what do you do? And, you know, 
it's interesting to me like reading this and like the way that people chose to approach it in these different books and like how unhealthy some of it is and purity culture did a number I think on a lot of us. <laughs> So Tim and Beverly LaHaye also wrote a book talking about some of the stuff. The LaHayes advised women to clean up, paint up, fix up before hubby returned home from work because the sight of a bedraggled wife rarely inspired love. <laughs> okay. But then they also situated sex more fully within the framework of patriarchal authority. God designed man to be the aggressor, provider, and leader of his family, they explained. And those roles were directly tied to a man's sex drive. You couldn't have a man's aggressive leadership without his aggressive sex drive, and women who resented the latter had better come to terms with this fact. In satisfying their husbands sexually, wives played a critical role in propping up men's egos, which in turn bolstered them for leadership. If a husband lacked confidence, his wife should make aggressive love to him, dress provocatively, and use her feminine charm to seduce him and help him bounce back. All of which ties a lot into the concepts behind purity culture, which was a movement that really took shape in the 1990s, which makes sense. It was like right as I was kind of coming of age, that was a big part of it. And it seemed to uphold stringent standards of female sexual purity while assigning men the responsibility of protecting women and their chastity. Female modesty was a key component of purity culture. Yeah, it was. If men were created with nearly irrepressible god-given sex drives, it was up to women to rein in men's libidos. Wives were tasked with meeting husbands every sexual need, but it was the responsibility of women and girls to avoid leading men who were not their husbands into temptation. And this is where we get rape culture and victim blaming, where it, you know, it was clearly your fault. And this is also where we get these kinds of abusive practices where women whose husbands would cheat on them, or even husbands who engaged in like abuse and molestation were told that it might be partly their fault because they weren't satisfying their needs, which is, oh my God. No, that's not, that's not how it is. And this I think is also where we get these ideas of like, men have this giant libido and women don't. And I can remember being taught that like, well, like men are driven by, by sex and women are driven by emotion and the need to feel loved. And, you know, I can remember as a very normal teenage girl who, of course, had a libido because, like, not everybody, I'm not going to say everybody, and it's not abnormal not to, like, there are asexual people, men and women, and that is also normal. But it is equally normal for teen girls who are not ace to have a libido, and I felt like something was wrong with me. I was like, something must be wrong with me because this is how men are supposed to feel about stuff. Um, and like, that's so messed up. It's so messed up. You also get a lot of discussion of militarized Christianity. Jerry Falwell was a part of promoting that and these very specific ideas of Christian masculinity and what that meant. Then you start to get this sort of cottage industry of books being published about Christian masculinity marketed to primarily white evangelical men. This includes books like Wild at Heart, which is definitely something that I read. That was also a, a big thing back in the day. John Eldridge was the author of that. And according to him, God created all men to long for a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. And like, this is what men need in order to really be a man. According to him, a woman sinned when she tried to control her world, when she was grasping rather than vulnerable, and when she sought to control her own adventure rather than share in the adventure of a man. So like very much this idea that like women exist to be part of a man's adventure and join in his goals, not to have their own, which like, it's like, oh my God. Then of course we had I Kiss Date and Goodbye, the other book that many of us in these circles read. And what's interesting, right, is that like now the author of that has actually had his book pulled from publication and said, I'm sorry, I did so much harm. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. We have Ron Luce, the creator of Teen Mania Ministries, who again was like, very militant in his ideas about Christianity, also rampantly homophobic and misogynist in the, the rules that they had about about things and purity culture and sin. I yeah, I, I, I actually 
went on a summer mission trip with Teen Mania Ministries as a teenager once, um, which missions trips are a whole other thing we can talk about. You also got John Piper very heavily into these complementarian ideas. In March 2018, on a podcast, he blamed egalitarianism for leaving women vulnerable. Complementarianism charged men to care for and protect and honor women, but Christian and non-Christian egalitarians had stripped women of that protection. And he remained convinced that manly valor would restrain male vice. And all of this was in the wake of many, many, many abuse scandals amongst Christian evangelical male leaders. But here's the thing. In 2009, John Piper, when he was asked whether a woman should submit to abuse, hedged. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. Oh my God. He said, well, it depends on what kind of abuse. Was the woman's life in danger or was this merely, quote, verbal unkindness? If her husband was asking her to engage in group sex or something really weird, bizarre, or harmful, then she might very gently refuse to submit. But if the abuse was just hurting her and not requiring her to sin, then she should endure verbal abuse for a season and perhaps being smacked one night. That is a direct quotation. Only then should she seek help from the church because yeah, no, don't do that. The church is not a good place for women who've been abused because often they're told to go back to their abusers to forgive them and allow them a second chance and like give them access to their children. <sighs> Look, like I know this is not everybody in the evangelical church, but it is a pattern. It's not a one-off. And this is one thing that I think has been interesting for me as I've started to connect with other people on this platform and on TikTok who are part of the deconstruction community is realizing that my experiences and the experiences of my friends are not one-offs because I think you're kind of gaslit by people still in the church to say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you, but like, I hope that won't like harm your view of the church in general. But then you take a step back and you start to hear from people all over the country who all had the same experiences and you're like, no, no, this is not a one-off. This is a system. This is a systematic problem. This is a systematic problem. And this, this book for me, I think was just really eye-opening, but also validating for the experiences that I've I've had. And maybe as we get further into the video, God, this is gonna be a long video. Um, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about some of it. And eventually I wanna talk more about some of these things, but I would highly recommend this book if you haven't checked it out yet. I think people should read it. One thing that I thought was pretty interesting that she touches on a little bit is that this hyper masculine version of manhood is also quite ableist and that there are disabled men who feel like, well, I can just never really be a man because I can't participate in some of the things that are supposedly what makes you a man. And yeah, I mean, that, yes, that is a problem. Meanwhile, we have this thing, which I think is true, is that a lot of people who grew up in purity culture and waited till they were married or even sometimes saved kissing for marriage, get married and then suddenly realize like, oh, this is a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be, or this isn't all that it was like built up to, to be as like the most fulfilling thing because like good sex takes work and time. It doesn't just like come naturally, right? Uh, but it was always like this, like, well, like the reward, your reward at the end of waiting is like this mind blowing wedding night, which like, no, <laughs> like good sex takes work and communication and time and like getting over all the hangups that purity culture imbued in you. Like that's not, that's not how it works. One other thing that I thought was pretty interesting is that the guy who started Multnomah Press, who published like James Dobson and a lot of these like big evangelical titles, eventually was distanced from this from this movement. And this I found really interesting. It says, after studying more closely the history of Native Americans and accounts of imperial conquest, he could no longer sustain the idea of America as an anointed nation. If you believe that America is God's chosen nation, you need to fight for it and against others, he realized. But once you abandon that notion, other values begin to shift as well. Without Christian nationalism, evangelical militarism makes little sense. And I, I think that is exactly right, is when you start to realize that like things are a lot messier than the way it's presented, because that was very much it of like, this is supposed to be a Christian nation. And like, religion was always politicized in these heavy ways that are, are not actually biblical. And then there was one other line that I loved in this book that I wanted to, to mention. 
My camera overheated and my battery is about to die, so I probably need to wrap this up. But I wanted to read a couple more quotes from here and then talk briefly about some of my takeaways from this. One thing she mentions is that there's been recent debates over the nature of the Trinity, which is is pretty interesting. There are some complementarian theologians who in 2016 advanced the theology that made Jesus eternally subordinate to God the Father in order, according to critics, to justify the eternal God-ordained subordination of women to men, which is, uh, you know, as it says here, parting ways with roughly two millennia of Christian orthodoxy. And, you know, some complementarians called this heresy, didn't agree with it, but I think this does raise an interesting question for critics, quote, were men defending patriarchy because they believed it to be biblical, or were they twisting the scriptures in order to defend patriarchy? Personally, I think it's the latter, um, but, you know, it's like an open question, open question. And I think the final thing that she says here is that even though this evangelical cult of masculinity, which I kind of love that as a way of framing it, because I think that is exactly what it is, a cult of masculinity. It stretches back decades, but its emergence was never inevitable, right? Some evangelical men themselves, and she talks about some of these through the book, have promoted alternative models, elevating gentleness and self-control, a commitment to peace, and a divestment of power as an expression of authentic Christian manhood, but instead we've had this like militant Christian manhood and she kind of ends hoping that maybe that could change. Um, but I think it's been really helpful for me to read this and use it as a framework for understanding kind of the, the evangelical milieu I came of age in. So even though my parents didn't necessarily subscribe to all of these ideas and they're not complementarians, totally, I did still get some of that. And like pieces of it still came through, even though they don't totally agree with some of this stuff. And we had a lot of books by Dr. Dobson in our house. And we listened to Adventures in Odyssey, which was like their sort of podcast before there were podcasts for, for kids, like a story podcast type thing. Uh, but we, we listened to that at bedtime. And, you know, I read I Kissed Dating Goodbye, and I read Wild at Heart, and I read Christian romance novels, and like all of this, which, you know, we'll talk about the romance novel piece of it later, and how that tied into some problematic ideas of gender roles and purity culture, because I've got books that are going to tackle that more specifically. But I think all of that kind of came together into this really unhealthy framework where like I never felt like I fit, but felt like I was supposed to. And I had friends who, you know, ended up in abusive relationships because of this stuff and ended up staying in them for longer than they should have or are still in maybe unhealthy relationships. Because when you're told that your job is to keep men from lusting, that that's like your responsibility of modesty and like not being alone with men you're not married to. <laughs> like, it's just, oh my God. Oh my God. Modest. It's just, it's a lot like, yeah. I, I think the conclusion that the author draws that this is not the direction that Christianity ever had to go. It wasn't a foregone conclusion is is exactly what I'm wrestling with now is given that that is the direction that it took and given how harmful being raised in that and we didn't even touch on most of the homophobic stuff either I kind of didn't read some of those passages but a lot of these people talking about complementarianism had this idea too that like your sexuality was caused by having like an overbearing mother <laughs> Like that boys were turned gay by having like overbearing, controlling mothers or being overly protected. And obviously, like, that is that is not the case. But the the level of harm that did and the transphobia that kind of came in with this idea. And we, we're still seeing this today. Like this has not gone away. These transphobic ideas of like, oh, well, these are just like, these virile men who are trying to pretend to be women so they can like be in girls bathrooms and locker rooms. It's such bullshit. It's such bullshit. And that's like, we still see those arguments. 
So you see that history and the way that it like created an entire culture and how damaging that is, how much abuse was swept under the rug for so long because it was expected for men to have this like difficult to control sex drive, right? And so if you're raised in a culture where God made men to have this difficult to control sex drive and women are responsible for managing that sex drive for them. I mean, how can you be surprised that there is rampant abuse <laughs> taking place? Not with everybody, of course, but rampant abuse, especially amongst the most masculine, hyper-masculine leaders at the, you know, the height of these organizations. And there were like one after another after another. Um, and then, you know, given the things that other people would say, even if the, that didn't happen, that it wouldn't be shocking if there, there were abusive things happening in their households that they're just like glossing over and treating as if they're nothing because of this messed up theology. So I understand that this is not everybody. Like I have people in my life who I love who are still, you know, practicing Christians and even more conservative Christians who are not like this. So I know it's not everyone, but I also know that it, you know, it's a lot more than a one-off, right? A, a whole hell of a lot more than a one-off. And I'm in a place in my life where like, I don't know how to negotiate that. Like I am still trying to figure out if I can separate God as I would potentially understand them now from God as I like, grew up believe I don't know but I don't know yet I don't know if I can find a way around that I'm I am wrestling with a lot of things right now in terms of like if I can come to a place of peace with that and I don't know I did read a book recently that I thought was pretty interesting that might be worth a read if you're looking for a way towards that it's called red lip theology and I really liked it I think it's an an interesting take on what a modern intersectional feminist theology might look like within Christianity. And I really appreciated the way that she tackled a lot of things. So that I think is an interesting book and one worth reading. So I'm glad that I read it. So I'm trying to like read from different things and figure out for, for myself and everyone's different. Like I have friends who like this has taken them to atheism because and, you know, which I think is is valid, is understandable for for a lot of people. Like our journeys take us to different places. That's not where I'm at at this point, but I'm I'm definitely still trying to figure it out. But I do think red lip theology offers an interesting vision of it, and that is one thing too that I didn't talk a lot about. There is a place in this book where it says that all of these books about like masculinity and manhood were very much the, the readership, the buyership, the target market was white men. And there was a different market of books targeted at black men because like black men are not safe to exhibit the same types of this militant masculinity that was promoted for white men. And so I think that is also a disconnect that is often not recognized. There is a reason that Sunday mornings are, they say, like the most segregated times in America. And that's not necessarily even a bad thing. That was one thing that I thought was interesting that the author of uh, Red Lip Theology, Candace Marie Benbow, talked about was how much she values the black church and how much she like doesn't want an integrated church. And I thought that was pretty interesting because of the role that the black church plays within the black community specifically. So there's a lot of conversations to be had in this space. And I think one thing that is worth keeping in mind is the fact that my experience is different from other people's experiences and that like the white evangelical church is a different beast from like the, the, the black church in its different forms. That I'm not coming at this from a perspective of like all religion is corrupt or bad. Like I know that is a place that some people get to and I've especially seen some white women who have come out of evangelical Christianity have been very hurt and traumatized by things that they underwent in the process 
and so understandably are angry at it and want to go the exact like the complete opposite but I think where we run into a problem is when you then castigate all religion as the same because there are also people who are Muslim and Jewish and Hindu and Buddhist and like so many different things and also like people who are Christians like within the black church for instance who have certain uh cultural and historical things associated with that and it's messy yes of course like these things are messy but I just want to kind of throw out there that I definitely respect other people's experiences with religion and that like there is cultural and spiritual value to however people choose to embrace or practice their spirituality. I say however, but I don't really mean however, because obviously there are cases where it can become toxic and harmful. And I think it's important to shine a light on those things. And so I think that's part of what like the the church the me too movement and then the church too movement like from within the church and now like a lot of the evangelical deconstruction movement that we're seeing online a lot of that is doing that is starting to like shine a light on these things that are very real <sighs> okay the last thing that i'll say before i stop because uh, like god this video is going to be so long um but the last thing that i that i'll say here is um it was really interesting maybe not not super surprising but interesting to me when I wrote my review on Goodreads for Jesus and John Wayne after I write my reviews I always like to like scan through and take a look at some of the other book reviews and you know unsurprisingly right like most of the one and two star negative reviews I mean all the ones I saw <laughs> were all from white men who were like clearly feeling very defensive and trying to couch it in like academic terms to make it seem like they were objectively criticizing the book but clearly they were just feeling really <laughs> like really defensive and like this isn't really how we think this isn't what complementarianism is and meanwhile myself and other people who in some of these reviews state that they're former evangelicals are like this is exactly what it is like this is this is exactly what it what it has been like and you know I feel like if you can't see that like you probably don't want to you know and not that there isn't another way because I think there absolutely is another way for this to go down but yeah so okay that was a lot. I don't know what this is going to look like when it's edited, but um, that is book one. I will be reading the other ones, I suspect, because they're all much shorter and we've covered a lot of ground with this one that my clips on the other ones will not be nearly as long, but I had a lot to say with this and I would highly recommend reading this if you are able to do so because um, it is a wild ride. Hello, I am back. I finished reading The Making of Biblical Womanhood and this was a really interesting book, especially in contrast with Jesus and John Wayne, because I think the two books are targeted at very different audiences and also have different projects, even though they're kind of playing in the same sandbox in some ways. Both books are written by historians, but in this case, we have a woman who is a medieval historian. And so because of that, the bulk of the history that's being traced in this book is beginning with the early church into the medieval church and the Reformation and early post-Reformation church with some ties to modern evangelical Christianity. The other thing that I would say about this is it's probably less progressive and I think the audience that this author is talking to is more people who are still within conservative or moderately conservative arms of the evangelical Christian faith. So while I feel like Jesus and John Wayne has a very progressive take on a lot of things and addresses issues like the LGBT community, for instance, this book doesn't do that. It kind of ignores that as an issue and primarily focuses on looking at the history of women as they were treated specifically in the church. And I will say that this book spends a lot of time talking about this issue of women teaching and preaching, especially to men. So I think there's a lot that's really good here. And it is certainly very interesting to see how things have changed. She offers a different reading of the Pauline texts that are often used to address complementarianism and female submission. And I think she offers pretty compelling arguments as to why given historical context, given context clues in the actual original text, 
that we shouldn't interpret it the way that patriarchy has interpreted it over the years. So I think that is interesting. She also talks about the fact that modern evangelical patriarchy today much more closely mirrors the Roman patriarchy that existed during the time of the early church, and that the church was called to be different and set up different household structures, different family structures than what you would typically see within the Roman. And she's got some quotations from the Bible as well about this kind of revolutionary idea that in Jesus there is no slave or free, Greek or Roman, male or female, but all are one in Christ Jesus, and talks a lot about biblical translations over the years that have actively worked to minimize the role and importance of women, translating words differently so that people seem like important players but not apostles, like Junia was an apostle, or sometimes even masculinizing names or separating chapters in certain ways to promote this gender hierarchy, or using gendered language and pronouns like choosing masculine pronouns when the original pronouns are actually gender neutral. It's interesting because these are small things, but they all play a lot into the text that we read in the modern era and the way that people interpret them. So it's pretty fascinating to see that piece of it. I think she does a good job kind of unpacking those bits. We also see how different things were in the medieval era. And one thing that I, I do find a little bit interesting is she talks about how in the modern day with purity culture, there's this idea of women as more innocent and men as more innately sexual and women need to protect men from their like voracious sexual appetites. Apparently in the medieval church, the reverse was actually believed to be true. People believed that women were the ones with these uncontrollable sexual appetites, that husbands really needed to satisfy their wives so that they wouldn't go out and sin, and it was just like a complete reversal. They were more likely to be seen as seductresses, and so it's interesting because there was such a reversal that took place. Then she moves on to the Reformation, and the thing that I think is really important there is she talks about how while she personally still believes in a lot of the theological changes that happened with the Reformation and is personally in favor of those changes, people don't always talk about the negative impact that parts of the Reformation had on women, on their livelihoods, on their opportunities, on their communities. So I think it's interesting. She definitely shines in the historical parts of it. I think where I wanted a bit more is in conclusions being drawn. I think she talks a lot about alternative arguments, but if you're not being a close reader, you might get confused and think that she's advocating for the arguments that she will lay out and then kind of undercut or suggest alternatives to. So I'm not sure how well that's going to work for some readers. It, you know, really depending on who's picking this up. And I wanted her to go farther with a lot of it. It's possible that it's because she's a historian or just her personality or her beliefs still being relatively more conservative as opposed to a more progressive take like Jesus and John Wayne, although she's, you know, like moderately progressive. But she doesn't seem to want to advocate for specific things or draw too many obvious conclusions in places where I think she really could. So I wanted a little bit more from this book, but I do think it's interesting and it builds out more of that church history and more of the early side of how we got to where we are. So actually, if I was going to recommend people, I would probably say read this first because I think this book really gets you from early church history through the Reformation and a little bit after. And then Jesus and John Wayne is specifically focused on the American context from the early 1900s to the modern day and the Trump era. And so I think when you put those things together, you can kind of trace these lines and it's 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 pretty it's pretty interesting. Again, I do think that this book was written firmly from the context of being still within the evangelical church, just wanting women to have less patriarchal structures over them, women being allowed to teach and preach and advocating for that. As somebody who grew up in evangelical churches where women were allowed to preach and maybe we wouldn't have like a female head pastor, but there wasn't a problem with having women speak or preach or teach to men, I think that this book neglects 
to unpack the other ways that women, even in slightly less conservative evangelical churches, are still subject to patriarchy and are still harmed by some of these teachings. So I, I think this book is doing a very specific thing. It does some of it really well, but I did want more from it than what I got. That said, I think it's adding in interesting ways to the context of what we're talking about here. So one thing that I think is interesting here is she talks about the emergence of the cult of domesticity with these ideas of female purity and piety and submission and women not being intended to work outside of the home, but that it didn't necessarily originate in the Bible and in church and actually some of it originated in ancient ideas, Roman ideas about men versus women and gender differences that she believes Paul was actually trying to push back on in some of his early writings. And she, you know, she talks about ancient Greek philosophers and their ideas of this difference of gender. And I find it to be pretty compelling. There was a belief in the ancient world that women were actually underdeveloped men and were like literally less evolved than men. And I think Charles Darwin actually believes something similar as well. She quotes him in this book. So it's interesting to see that progression, but her arguing that Jesus and Paul were arguing for more equality between men and women and were arguing against those beliefs and so seeing how it's been twisted over time is interesting. She says, when I first learned about the cult of domesticity, all I could think about was James Dobson. His book Love for a Lifetime made a lasting impression on me. I clearly remember reading how women were designed to be more passive than men, how women were physically weaker and more prone to emotional instability, how women preferred the safety of the home and a breadwinning husband over the harsh working world of corporate America. Suddenly his attitude made sense. What Dobson was teaching about women's natures wasn't biblical. It was rooted in the cult of domesticity and ancient ideas about the biological inferiority of women. Dobson was simply preaching the 19th century cult of domesticity, the only difference being that he had now sanctified it. So yeah, I think there's a lot to like in this book. I wish it had gone farther. I think there are some things missing here, but I would recommend reading it. And this is the sort of book that I could see giving to more conservative family members who maybe wouldn't be quite ready for a Jesus and John Wayne conversation. But there's there's definitely some some good stuff here. And she makes some really strong arguments for her case in my opinion. I think the most logical progression for these books is going to be moving to romancing God. So we're going to go from the historical context of the difference of women and then we're going to look at the history of Christian romance novels as I read Romancing God and see what can we take away from that about the culture of women in evangelical Christianity and the kinds of things that sets up in terms of gender roles. And then lastly, we're going to go to hashtag church too and talk about purity culture and the Me Too movement within the church, because I do think that a lot of these supposedly Christian ideals of love, romance, marriage, femininity, etc. have laid the groundwork for abusive practices that have taken place. At the end of this book, she does talk a little bit about the Church Two movement, which I appreciate and how it affected her personally. And I think a lot of women on some level have been affected by it negatively. One other thing that I want to talk about here is I recently saw on Twitter some conversation about a book that just came out and I took a look at some of the reviews. It's supposedly pushing back on purity culture, but from what I understand, it seems as if it's really just repackaging purity culture <laughs> for this new era. So I think I'm actually also going to pick up that book and read it so we can talk about how this conversation is changing or shifting in 2022. What are these conversations looking like? from within parts of the church and parts of conservative Christianity that are still trying to perpetuate some of these ideas. Like, like, what does that look like? I think that that could be interesting. That is the end of part one, which is taking a historical perspective on the development of evangelical Christianity and the role of women and men in the church. Stay tuned for part two, where I'm going to be talking about inspirational fiction, Christian romance novels, and the role that they play in the lives of the evangelical women and in navigating patriarchy and gender roles in marriage. And then finally, you will be getting a part three where I'll talk specifically about purity culture, the Me Too movement, and the Church Too movement. So 
Stay tuned for more. Talk to me in the comments down below. Please stay respectful. Heads up for anybody who's new here, I actively work to maintain a safe space for discussion that is respectful and kind and acknowledges different people's perspectives, but any form of harassment or bullying will not be tolerated, whether it's towards me or towards other people in the comments just an FYI. But I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. I know I have a variety of people watching my channel, some of whom have the same background as me, some of whom this might be new to them. So I'd be really curious to hear people's perspectives and thoughts. If this isn't your background, is this what you expected to hear or what you thought things were going to be like? I'd be curious to hear from you. And if there are other topics in a similar video series you'd be interested in hearing on from me, let me know in the comments down below. I, I feel like there is a lot to say on this topic. If you guys like this video, it does help if you give it a thumbs up, although if you give it a thumbs down it helps too. Thank you algorithm. <laughs> Subscribe if you'd like to see more and hit the bell icon if you want to be notified the next time I post a video. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.